hang on. Yeah, and after that, I'll welcome Jan van Bonstorff. You're very welcome. The word is yours. Thank you very much. It's nice being here. First, uh, let's test the sound. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. perfect. Very good. Thank you. Now, uh, I hope you can see my screen. I'm just trying just a minute. Okay. Okay, are you with me? Fine. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's nice starting the venue. And uh, I'm going to talk about a project that has recently received seed money from Circus, from the, which is called the Center for Integrated Research on Culture and Society from this Uppsala University, which we're really happy about. And it's not only myself, uh, I have two other colleagues here today who are working on, on this project, and that is Anna Fuka and also Lars Oestreicher, who can sort of uh, answer questions as well. And this project, I'm trying to keep the time of 10 minutes, which is really too little here, but the project as a whole is called the image as the living counterpart, uh, how art and visual ephemera can contribute to beneficial AI modeling. A visual ephemera needs an explanation, perhaps it's called Vardagstryk in Swedish, which is just any any image that isn't art actually and isn't a, a, a medical or scientific image. Well, this, uh, this is a large project and we are a lot of other people also here like uh, in, in the project Blittinger Johansson and, and also Johan Eriksson who are not here today. We have different work packages but today I'm going to concentrate on, on Lars and my work package, what's in an image and about the beneficial objectives of the image and also a little I will come into Anna Fuka's part of the intersectional assessment of what we're going to, to analyze. And uh, talking about beneficial uh, art, artificial intelligence, I mean, I'm the art historian here, so, so I feel really um, unsecure talking about these things, but uh, I think it's important for, for our end goals. Uh, Stuart Russell has written about this and talked about this in wonderful uh, lectures on the Stanford, uh, at the Stanford University. And uh, well, approvably beneficial systems, they're supposed to be aware of positive human, human values. And then also of course of, of the negative ones as well, negative values. And the machine's objective and artificial intelligence should be to maximize this uh, realization of the human values and to minimize, of course, the negative ones. And the best source of this information about human values is how we act, that's human behavior. And when I talk about human values here, it's not d the deep uh, philosophical eth ethics of this, it's more like the everyday values when, when people, when we have eaten well, we have watched television, and then we sort of think about something useful and, and uh, good to do. And th this is a kind of a, a positive human value I'm thinking about. And uh, well, and the actions, I mean, human behavior, agency and actions and so on. This is where things become really interesting for art historians, because this is a very well covered area uh, within when we're talking about images. And images, of course, they are rec records of human behavior as well as along with texts and objects and, and other cultural artifacts. And thus images can aid machines to understand in understanding human values. This is a kind of a starting point. And the project would, where do we end? Well, how can visual records aid beneficial AI? Well, one intermediary goal, we are actually working on it now, advanced and precise image search within specialized contexts kind of specialized search engines. But there are other goals as well. I mean, teaching uncertainty. And uncertainty is really interesting. Uh, I mean, machines, according to Stuart Russell's, machines should be aware about, but unsure about human objectives. Uh, and this works as a kind of a safety, safety valve. 
the AI becomes unsure about the choice and chooses to stop the process, ask a human for advice, or even to, to uh, decides to shut itself off. And in this way, uh, uncertainty can, can be instrumental for, for AIs. And well, that's a lot of uncertainty in, at different levels in, in images. So th this is one really interesting area. And another one is, of course, long range thinking at multiple levels abstraction, which is still a kind of a, uh, as I've understood it, a general future goal of, of uh, art artificial intelligence de decisions. And interest interestingly enough, this reflects, I mean, this long range thinking uh, reflects the processes of historical change in images, negotiated style and visual shorthand over long periods of time. But I won't have time to go into these two things today, only this kind of first part of the image search. But first, something about agency in images. Uh, images can be very, very active, like normal interpolations, like Roy Lichtenstein here, the untitled, hey, you, pointing di directly in the camera, or uh, engagement by shock, like Toscani's ad had from, from, from the Benetton ads from the 90s, a long series of kind of uh, shocking ads where the soldier carrying a, a thigh bone of a human being, and, uh, and then more mystical, intricate, and very, very difficult to, to sort of sort out how does agency work in this picture of, of Miss Nellie O'Brien from, from the 18th century? She has a gaze that is really piercing, but why? And well, art historians work a lot on these things. Uh, and, uh, but I, I would like to, I mean, I would like to use these agentific traits to, to find pictures. And as an example, I've taken the concept of charitable actions. I would like to find meaningful images, images that really be, mean something relating to the concept charitable actions. Then I go to Google and I find a lot of images, of course, but I find a lot of junk, actually. There's a lot of text, of course, of charitable actions, but the, the visuality is, is really uh, lacking here. Only one picture is, I could use for something, this in at Wikipedia, Wikipedia has, is, uh, has quality. Pinterest, please forget Pinterest. They have lots of wrongly annotated pictures. The metadata is really uh, bad here. So never use a, a picture from Pinterest without checking what, what, what it is about. No, what would I like to find when I search uh, charitable actions? I would like to find meaningful pictures like this one from this year. Uh, a charitable action, a sort of a lifeline worker, visiting somebody in New York, New York and bringing medicines and perhaps solace for, for the corona victim. Or I would find what's uh, the Good Samaritan from 1850, uh, an old uh, of course, theme from the Bible, or I would find the lady with the lamp, Florence Nightingale, during the Crimean War in the 19th century walking around. And this would be a sort of sensible and meaningful and, and uh, I mean, something that I could use uh, relating to the concept of charitable actions. So what we need is a, uh, not, well, Google is okay, but we need human professionals working together and aiding AIs. Uh, and the AI should be trained in complex reasoning as they should have some kind of altruism uh, built in as well. How do we go about our project? We use a lot of magazines, you see, then down here we have chosen, let's see now, that's a little bit outside. Yes, we would like to scan and we are scanning just now a huge amount of Swedish magazines from the middle of the, of the 20th century. And uh, we would like to have a, a new uh, stock of images. This is a kind of a bottleneck. It's quite easy to find American and uh, British magazines on the net but there are, there is a scarcity of, of Scandinavian ones. So we'd like to make an input with the help of the university library to, to use a lot uh, of images. The images we annotate, and I'll talk a little about of that more. We have uh, very different kinds of images. This is kind of interesting just because of the, of the visual ret rhetorics built in. This is uh, the agent here is actually the, the buyer 
herself, it looks like, like a lady. And uh, buying something very small for, for very, very little money. And so it's a kind of an agency that is uh, well, alluded to. Uh, and then the, the problems start. And here, Anna Fokas part, part comes in with the, with the intersectional things. Uh, nowadays, we don't eat turtle soup anymore, or perhaps I wouldn't, or we shouldn't, or whatever. There are some kind of, of problems with turtle soup. And well, the problem sort of amass. I mean, if you look at these magazines, uh, we can find about any, any prejudice you can think of, and we have to handle them in some way. And it's not only prejudices, but also harassing uh, historical events like the Algerian war. How do we go about working with these, with these really harassing pictures? It's a kind of a ethical problem. And then the weird ones, like the one in the middle, the ad for the frame deodorant from 1968, hunted, perhaps alluding to the to the film uh, Bonnie and Clyde from 67 or something like that. But it's it's hard, really hard to know. And then going to to other uh, very interesting small advertisements that uh, carry a lot of of uh, content on on a, on a small place. I won't go into the details here about the metaphors and so on, but these are our annotations. So how do we work now? At first, we, we write specialized annotations with a deliberately very flowery language, lots of nouns and describing adje adjectives. And then we feed the description with uh, the image into some kind of an ontological library like WordNet, for example, and BERT and, and uh, other things here. This is Lars Österreicher's area. And here we would acquire a kind of a word cloud, a set of and sets of antonyms, of homonyms, and different metonyms, connections, word connections for our quite short natural language uh, the, the, the description. And uh, these, well, they form clouds around the document if you want to uh, visualize it. And uh, the word clouds can be compared to other similarly annotated images and possible matches can be found. These are sort of matches for, for, for this kind of image. And this is a, the first stage with a, with a recursive uh, neural network of some kind or, or different kinds. And then the second stage, this is number four here, going to the convolutional neural network where the annotations plus the images are fed uh, into the network and we are trying to teach it to find similar results, similar images on an un annotated uh, in an unannotated data bank. Well, I, I think I, my time is over. I think I have to stop here. What about it? Yes. Well, thank you. That was very nice. Uh, uh, at the beginning, I said that if anyone has to leave early, then you have a chance to ask questions. And otherwise, we would save them up to the end. But if anyone has a question, then you can raise your hand now. Or else we just proceed to the next. To the next. Uh, now I can see the. Go through here and see if any. No, that's good. Then we take them at the end together with everyone else. And we proceed straight away to the next speaker and that will be uh, David Sumter. You are very welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to, yeah, I'm sharing my screen already. I've just got to press this thing um, so that you can see what I'm talking about. Um, so I thought I'd pose the um, how intelligent are the algorithms which claim to understand you? And I thought this would be a good starting point for our discussions today. Um, I've written a book um, a couple of years ago now. It came out called Outnumbered or Utrechnad at the Svenska. I think the name is more appropriate in Swedish actually because outnumbered it sort of means that you're, it's, the, it's to give the idea that you're kind of overcome by the algorithms and numbers which can your life nowadays. But utrechnet also in, in Swedish means that I'm trying to rekne ut or understand how these algorithms work. So I, I really like the sort of 
triple meaning maybe in Utrechtnet is, is what, I'm, what I'm trying to achieve here. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the types of things that I found out when I was doing this. And in particular, you read a lot in the media about how intelligent algorithms are. This was one of the, the things that got me started on this project. There was a series of headlines which got more and more extreme as, as time went on. So this was started with how Facebook knows you better than your friends do. It went on to Facebook knows you better than members of your own family. And then ultimately, the New York Times, um, not unknown to have exaggerated headlines, had Facebook knows you better than anyone else. And so their conclusion now is that Facebook apparently understands you better than your mom, your dad, your children, your friends, everybody. Now, what do they really mean by that? I decided I'd, I'd try and find out. What I did is I started, and when you do these types of things, I find it very useful and I get my students to do this, is you start with yourself. And I started with myself and my friends. What I did is I categorized my friends on 13 dimensions, if they were posting about work, products, advertising, and so on. And then I put them into a spreadsheet and I used a technique called principal component analysis, which is a very common technique used in machine learning and, and data science, which basically tries to reduce, um, reduce a matrix of 13 by 30 down to just two dimensions, which explain the properties of my friends. And I found that I could categorize my friends in three different ways. Um, I, yes, I use something called k-means clustering is the, is the second type of algorithm I used here. So principal this reduces the dimension and then k-means clustering um, actually uh, puts them into different categories and I found three different categories for my friends I found ones that I've called all work no play probably reflective of quite a few of you who are sitting here a lot of my academic friends were in this category they posted on Facebook a lot about things that happen in the public sphere and also things that happen in the workplace so their um, the conferences they've been to workshops they've been involved with the group they were called the I think that group we all know them as well they have opinions Alma has a lot of opinions about theater and arts Richard had a lot of opinions about Brexit at the time Conrad had um, opinions about computer games and they tended to post on those types of things and finally these are ones everybody knows they're the here I am people here am I and they post about their family pictures of their dinner lots of pictures of pets and so on thing here is that my algorithm has picked out this three group of people and it's me that's given the names but it's very important to realize that it's the algorithm that made this decision so in this sense the algorithm can really pick out different types of people and classify them also a bit like a, a, a bit like Jan was talking about with art th these algorithms can start to do this types of classifications and lots of the times they make reasonable sense now Facebook do this Thousands of advertising categories where they have they have 100 million likes of different things they have 2 billion people and they reduce them down to tens of thousands of advertising categories I thought a few of them they've changed this recently but at the time I wrote the book a few of them were lots of fun there was the British royal family there was 50 million people classified as that upper middle class people were classified as neck which I'm not really sure what that is I think it's people who might like a massage and then there's platypus so that's um, uh, the now what is it called I think it's degur in, in Swedish or it's a it's a um it's a, a little thing that lives in Australia and swims around unique to Australia um, and th those are those are classifications of people based maybe on where they travel what they do and so on and in one sense again Facebook knows us better because it can classify 10 million types of different or 10,000 different types of people rather than just the two or three different types of people that I can keep in my head Cambridge Analytica scandal while I was writing the book, which was really fascinating because they took the New York Times headlines and all of the hype around artificial intelligence and they claimed that they could manipulate the election to in favor of um, Donald Trump. And then there was a whole thing where Chris Wiley came out and claimed that he was Steve Bannon's psychological warfare tool constructor and he'd made this tool which had won Donald Trump the election. But when I started to in more detail, I found that a lot of the claims that Cambridge Analytica were making were really overblown. 
In fact, when they tried to do something, um, what, they, what they claimed to do was, they claimed they could um, classify the personality of every person in the USA. But when you actually look at the data, this is some of the data um, just of 100 people, where you try to find if people are neurotic measured from a psychological test, and if they're neurotic measured from Facebook data, you get a really weak correlation. You get some positive correlation, enough to publish a paper, enough to publish a paper which attracts um, great headlines in the New York Times, because the New York Times headline I mentioned at the start was based exactly on this study, but not really enough to identify neurotic people in the USA. And so there was a lot of overclaiming on the part of Cambridge Analytica. And a lot of the research I did um, in the book, talk about later, is really revealing some of the myths about social media and algorithms. For example, I found that um, a lot of the stuff about fake news being spread was very much um, overblown. Fake news is not spread to the extent, or it, it is spread, but it's not taken as seriously um, as you might be led to believe. Also, the idea that you live, people live in a filter bubble and can't get news from the other side of the opinion, that of liberals, but it turns out not to be true of conservatives in the USA who have a lot of access to liberal news. It's just they don't agree with it. So I found a lot of those types of things, which we can certainly discuss later. But one, one thing, so what are the worries of algorithms? Well, one thing I found is, this is a very nice study done by Carol Cardua, and she found that if you, um, this is now removed from Google, most of these are removed from Google, but there used to be this autocomplete problem in Google. She wrote, ah, woman, then it would come up with the suggestion, evil, stronger than men, or equal to men as the possible autocompletes there. And a lot of that is based on what happens inside the word algorithms used inside Google. One thing I did is I trained up one of these word algorithms and what you can do is you can ask it these kind of analogy questions. So intelligent minus David plus Susan is equal to what? So intelligent David, what Susan is to and then um, you should have a, a new word that comes in. And if you train up the algorithm to do those types of problem, you get the following answer, resourceful. Okay, so I'm smart, Susan, who's uh, in fact, David's the most common name of someone my age in the, in the UK. Susan is the most common name of a woman of that age. And so, yeah, she's resourceful while I'm, I'm smart, I'm intelligent. It's, it's not quite right, but it gets worse, I'm afraid. So brainy my Susan is equal to prissy. So that's like somebody who's sort of overly concerned with her appearance and, and um, ha what people think of her. And the brainy David has a completely different image. And then you have, this is the worst one, smart minus David plus Susan is equal to sexy. So I'm somehow meant to be smart and Susan's sexy is the equivalent of that. And the reason this comes up, and it's also related very much to what Jan was just talking about, is that it's trained on our past prejudices. It takes in all the words and sentences we've ever written, it trains it up, uh, the algorithms are trained up, and then they repeat our prejudices back to us. So that's one of the big problems with these types of algorithms. Biggest dangers are the algorithms learn from our mistakes and not in a good way. Algorithms lack common sense and moral understanding, and we often overestimate what they can do and how neutral they are. I thought I'd just close, I'm gonna close with a couple of pictures of different people. This one particularly, I don't know, annoys me maybe or whatever. This, this is Max Tengmark and he's sitting on a stage with a bunch of um, intellectuals and leaders in um, IT and uh, the, you've, got, you've got Dennis Habibis, who's the a leader of Google Brain there. Elon Musk is sitting on the left-hand side. And these guys all agree with each other um, that AI is in the future going to take over, um, in the too distant future, it's going to take over and be as intelligent as us. Uh, they, they disagree about how much of a risk this is, but they all very much agree on that. But when I looked into this, I really can't see any evidence for this. I mean, just now, AI is on a sort of bacterial intelligence level. And I don't think that we're really in a risk of having that sort of explosive AI. We have certain problems it can solve, but the general intelligence problem is a long way away. Instead, what I think is important and incredibly underfunded is 
the type of research looking at this, these algorithms. So while these guys all have massive salaries and sit talking and philosophizing about how important AI is, blah, 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 blah. A lot of the journalists who are working on this type of area and also writers working on this type of area have no financing whatsoever to do their work. They have to have small grants to um, produce certain uh, radio programs or TV programs to look into this or books and so on. But to have fi financing for this type of algorithmic activism and it's something that we've tried to do a lot we've had a, a couple of meetings on um, mathematical activism what um, th these are former members of my research group Victoria Spicer and Richard Mann who are now in Leeds um, and Milena Sapkowski who's now in LSE and Alex, I've forgotten where he's gone to <laughs> but they, we, when we when they worked in our research group we did a lot of how we can use math understand the world and uh, also the types of problems that I've talked about today. And I think that is what I wanted to say. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Thank both of you. We have now heard two very interesting uh, presentations or, or speeches. And um, again, if anyone has to leave, you have the opportunity to ask a quick question maybe not a long discussion. We are going to take a little break, but before that, is it anyone who would like to? I don't see any raised hands. That's good. Then we take them together in a uh, common discussions at, uh, in the end. So the time is now exactly quarter to two. So I was suggesting if anyone has to go to the loo or to fetch a cup of coffee, we'll take uh 10 minutes so if we could start five two exactly five two uh, then we'll start again i'll turn off the recording now don't get a bright you're welcome the word is yours frederick so my my first words will be uh, can you hear me and uh, does this work now yes oh that's good um, I had to move around a bit because I have a, I, I had to switch computers and there's a shaky Wi-Fi connection on this floor. Um, yes, so uh, I, I thought that when I, I got the offer to, to be here, thank you for that, uh, I thought that uh, what I could contribute with was just examples of how concretely you would work with uh, some kind of digital humanities uh, problem in pattern recognition. Uh, so I will focus on two examples instead of uh, sort of more, more meta discussion or, or too much of, um, of my current work. So this is, uh, this is old work on how to sort of quantify the similarity between manuscripts. Um, so I'm Fredrik Wahlberg, I'm a senior lecturer in computational linguistics. Uh, and m I, what I'm currently working on for, towards uh, digital humanities is uh, attributing scribes to, uh, to primarily medieval material. So to try to be able to, to quantify the kind of feeling you would get from, if you look at the slides, yeah, I have three images to the right. So the topmost two, you can get a feeling for that one of them is sort of more straight than the other, but how do you quantify this? this similarity or dissimilarity. And especially if you compare it then to, to the third, third lower image, uh, how, how does that work? And what does that mean for identifying if the, if the scribal hand is the same or if the, the, the year of production uh, would be similar? Um, for you who are from a library background, this is uh, C61. So it's the revelations of St. Bridget. Uh, my internet connection has been a bit shaky. so. And I can't see the chat, so there's no way of telling me that it doesn't work. Um, but if I need to do anything again, I, I hope that you guys will tell me. So uh, my example is going to start with Sörens Diplomatorium Suvikatratek, SDHK. Uh, this is a collection that the Swedish National Archive has. It's really 44,000 charters from the Swedish medieval era, era, era marked at the bottom of the timeline. and. Uh, the objective for, for, these, uh, for this group of studies was to model the changes over time of the handwriting and also of the, the style of, of writing of the transcribed charters. So if we had 11,000 photographed charters and about 5,000 transcribed, 
And I think that we are in digital humanities, we're really good at making the, the, the archives. We are not uh, as uh, good at, at doing the sort of large scale analysis. An analogy could be that we are looking at, at the individuals and we're working with the individuals, but we haven't reached what sociology does, so that sort of looking at uh, groups of people and, and, and how, how, how groups are working. And I think that's an analogy that works for these manuscripts too. So what can we learn if we study 10,000 or 100,000 manuscripts at the same time? So that's what I'm, I'm trying to do with computers. So now, uh, I, half of what I'm going to talk about is turning these charters into positions because uh, in relation to, to David's talk, you saw that he encoded information about his Facebook friends, uh, and then he could get uh, some two-dimensional space out of this, uh, while he had, had more, more categories than, than two. So I'm trying to do the same thing, but I'm trying to do it from image data and text data. And that's what I will try to explain here. So a way of looking at text data is that we can look at character frequencies, for example. Not every language has the same frequencies of some characters. For example, English has about 13% ease, uh, while for Dutch it's way higher and for Swedish it's slightly smaller. So just based on, on these character frequencies that we can find in transcribed charters, we can identify the language. Now we know what the language is in this case, so that's not too interesting. But for these two charters, we have uh, the 5,683, uh, and all of these are dated on the day, uh, since they are they, they also have some legal standing, these documents. Often they uh, transfer so, uh, land, for example, between two people, or maybe they transfer it to a convent, given that the, the profit is used for making someone who has joined the convent their life easier until that person dies or stops being at the convent, and then the soil should be returned back to the family. Um, for the other one, we have, uh, they just have these nondescript names. It's 32,268. And this is a way later charter. So a way that we can look at language change, for example, is that we can look at what are the, the suffixes that we find. So in the suffixes for the earlier charter, we can find something that indicates the dative form of the old case uh, grammar of Swedish, of old Swedish, though in the newer, modern, more modern Swedish, we don't have that anymore. And that is one sign that we can use, like what is the probability of us finding this suffix? Uh, we can use that for, for, um, for dating these transcriptions. Um, to the right, you have a bar plot where the lots of, uh, uh, lots of characters that you can find in transcriptions. So then that would be the probabilities for all these all these ones, that would be one way of representing this, uh, this charter as a position. So we have, uh, if we had a, a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional space, like a three-dimensional space is the one that we are going around in. I don't know if you can see my hand, but you would usually have one, an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis. So we have three directions to move around in. Here we simply extend that. Don't try to imagine it, that doesn't work. But but that, that's what we're doing. So now instead we have maybe a, a 200 or 2000 dimensional space where each charter is a position. Um, and now then just looking at the, 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 the simple character, this, the distribution over simple characters like A and B and C and so on is not that informative. But if we look at them, them in sequence, then we get uh, a much weirder bar plot where you can't even see what everything is for because it's too dense. Um, but that is the kind of quantification that I can do for, for turning these charters into positions uh, and then looking at, at that, that language. Now, I, I only have these as positions so far. I haven't said anything about how we attribute that to a writer or a date, but hopefully these positions that we have would be very close if it's the same scribe or if it's during the same time. For images, we can do something similar. Uh, let's see if I, yes. For images, we can do something similar. So now I, you have the text in the background, but then the, the charters, how they actually look are, are there again. And if we focus on then the ink strokes of these and look at the, the shapes of these ink strokes, there's different ways of doing this. Uh, if I do this with a, a CNN, it's a convolutional neural network, which was mentioned in, in 
John's presentation, uh, I can't really do any good visualizations like this. So these would be then simpler uh, or less complex, I should say, uh, models or methods that I've been using. So now if we have this charter, we can look at where are the sort of the edges of all the ink strokes, and then we can catalog these. We can let the computer catalog these and, and, um, and say that uh, we have a number of groups of different ink strokes, very similar actually to the way David uh, clustered his Facebook friends. But now I would be instead trying to find the clusters of different ink strokes or common strokes. And then we can describe this, this image as a set of like, probabilities of finding certain uh, ink strokes. So if we have a more round text, for example, then we would have a, a higher probability of find, finding round shapes instead of if, if they're more straight. But also, if, if they're more straight, we could look at, is it then if we have a baseline, is it 90 degrees to the baseline? Is it along the baseline and so on? But I let the computer do that. And the thing that you're seeing, the, the, the right topmost image is a, is a histogram uh, of um, different shapes. You can say that every position in this, uh, in this pixelized image is a certain type of shape. And then the red zones, that's where you find um, most of the shapes that we find are in, uh, are in these zones and they represent then some, a certain shape. And if um, we would have a more rounded uh, uh, if we would have a more rounded uh, writing, then these red zones would be more stretched out. Now it's a more straight, and then uh, they're more straight strokes, and then they're more concentrated to these two positions. Uh, I've been working with a, a philologist on, on, and paleographers on, on doing this stuff, and what we're trying to do is to do something that might be interpretable, or at least that you can get an intuition as, as a researcher within these specific fields on what, what you are seeing and analyzing. Mm -mm -mm. So now we have this, we have both the, the representation from the text and we have some representation of, um, of, the, of the image of how the ink strokes look. Using these, um, so the, the positions in this space. Um, now, what we would do, I hope that you guys can see in the animation to the right. So now we can take about 10% of the, can, can, could someone just respond and say that if you can see the animation on the right? Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. I can. Uh, so what we do often, and, and this goes back to the problems of AI of the earlier talks, is that we try to have some set of data that we train on, and then we get the model to generalize from that. So it's not a human generalizing, it's, an, it's a computer generalizing under some constraints which are defined by a human. Uh, which is uh, the reason why if I were to put in a charter that's actually from the 1500s into this model and say that it's from the 1300s, it will learn wrong just as if you include uh, maybe gender or race bias into a language model, then it will learn that that's the correct way of, of representing reality. But what we get with these positions uh, is a kind of a cloud in a high dimensional space. I projected this down to a three dimensional space to make it a bit more uh, well easy to look at. And, and the computer can just gen then generalize in this space and say that these areas, those are old charters and some other areas are, are younger charters or yeah, younger charters. Um, in this particular animation, the red ones are 1509 upwards, and I think the blue ones are 1300 something down, down from there on, uh, on the timeline. But you can see that there's some structure going on there, uh, though one shouldn't read too much into it since it's, uh, I've had to compress three, I think 200, no, this is 2,400 2, dimensions into three dimensions. So it's a bit like taking the globe, flattening it to two dimensions, and then hoping that the distance between uh, capital, capitals, for example, would still hold, and, and of course it doesn't. But after then training on and letting the computer generalize from 10% of these charters, we predict on 90, and uh, we hope for the best. Hopefully we, we get something that's, uh, uh, that's good. 
So what we get out is a, a sort of a guess. And uh, currently, uh, most of the methods that I tried out, we can do about 50% are dated within about 12 years, it says here. But what we get out is that we get a, a, a bell curve over the timeline. And these bell curves also, uh, if, if the method gets it right, they should be more stretched out if the, if the uncertainty of the model is higher, and they should be more narrow and higher if, if it's a more if, if there's a higher certainty about this particular classification or mapping to, uh, to the timeline. However, this, what we could discuss is how can we actually trust these models? What do they see? Because it's just a correlation machine. It just looks at what we've given it and then try, it tries to generalize. It doesn't understand what it's seeing. There's no understanding what a particular word or, or suffix or anything, or even grammar what it would be in this in these models that I presented. And it's the same thing with, uh, with the imaging. It doesn't know anything about ink strokes or, or anything like that. Um, and also then I, I th I've th something I'm interested in is like for the people who are not from a computer science background, would you trust me if I gave you this number and under what conditions could these things be trusted? Because we can use them concretely re within research, but when are they relevant and not? Um, so we compare the predictions that the model has made with the uh, known years of the charters, and then we have an expected prediction error. Um, so what I'm doing currently is that I'm trying to, uh, to, to do this, but just with more data. So uh, we're up to 900 years of text data in a paper I, I hope to be finishing within two weeks. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but then it's about what I, what I think is interesting is uh, qualitative interpretation and robustness, especially because most collections are, are uh, photographed during a long time with different photo uh, technology. And also uh, we have multiple standards of uh, transcription. So such a thing, simple thing as are abbreviations expanded or not? And in Latin, I think it's fairly standardized, but for old Swedish, I don't think so. And then also looking at uh, the, the codicology of these manuscripts, because right now we're only looking at ink strokes. Um, and for the historical language models, I think it would be interesting to look more at historical grammar. Uh, that's something that we're trying to do. So the grammar changes for old Swedish, for example, between the old case system and the new as, as I uh, as I mentioned, now that can be something, and try more models. Um, the uh, the illustration to to the right is actually from one of my earliest projects that gave me money for for the, the my my PhD, uh, which is how I, we try to uh, to look at the images for these A's and see how they could uh, all the A's from from a particular uh, book from Sumura. It, at the Uppsala University Library, how that looked. Uh, yes, that, that was my presentation. So thank you guys for listening. Thank you. And on here, I'm going to try to get you all here. And so then, uh, thank you very much.